started. Uh, so this is the uh, Rlang Package Docs Club. Um, today I will be starting the meta programming section. I did want to just point out that we have nobody signed up next week. Um, if one of you on the call or someone watching the YouTube wants to sign up, uh, the spreadsheet is linked in the um, chat. Links in the app, the Android app at least, are not working well with Slack right now. So if you can't get to it, just let me know and I'll send you there. Or you can go to r4ds.io slash rlang. Um, but uh, we'll, we'll deal with that uh, next or in the coming week. If no one signs up, I will still, I'll do it, but I'd rather someone sign up. All right. So let's go ahead and get started on the chapter. So this is chapter three, or chapter three, quote unquote, chapter three. Uh, the third section of our notes, metaprogramming. Um, specifically, I'm talking about the diffusing our expressions um, article in on the uh, help page, which I should load up. Um, so it's this, diffusing our expressions, and then a whole bunch of um, help docs that kind of go with it. So what I'm hoping we'll take away from this, and there's a big maybe on that first one, is to, uh, first of all, explain why it's useful to know about diffused expressions. Um, as we'll talk about a little bit, this is like the, the whole framework underneath tidy evaluation is what we're gonna be talking about today. And after the first version of um, our line came out, they came up with the embrace operator that kind of replaces a lot of the diffusion or di diffusing stuff, or not, not even kind of, like entirely replaces it for almost all situations. But we're going to talk about, you know, why is it useful to know about them? Um, we're going to describe the relationship between diffusing and lazy evaluation and how like lazy evaluation leads to at least the term diffusing. Um, we're going to compare and contrast the three types of diffused expressions. That's just a real quick look. And then we're going to differentiate between expert for diffusing your own expressions and end quote and quotes for diffusing expressions supplied by the user, user of your function. And um, we're going to compare our lang diffusing to base our equivalents. And then past that, we're going to talk about some of the function um, ins and outs uh, in as much detail as we feel like going into basically and have time for. All right, so first up, I had, why should we care about diffuse expressions? And I changed that to, should we care about diffuse expressions? Um, I, I have in these notes here, there are links to uh, searches in the CRAN GitHub repo for expert um, or, and then the other one is for enquo. Um, I kind of scanned through what is in here and mostly it's like literal, um, metaprogramming, and actually the other thing that it is and what GT summary is, is when you want to um, log what the user said. So like um, it's used in making automatic labels for charts that you want to know what did they use to create that label. And so by default, you'll just say like the actual function mean of sill is what you want to use. And so that's where you capture what they said um for that use and, and like glue syntax probably replaces that but depending how you want to work with things you um often would want to just like capture that it literally what they typed um uh and then some stuff like you know where they're coding the um curly curly <laughs> they had to use the expert and end quo under the hood and then kind of likewise end quo um, is Enquo is almost, I mean, it's pretty much purely tidyverse or things that are working with the tidyverse because that's where, like, that's what it means, basically. I mean, it could be used in other contexts, but um, that's the thing that has really strongly implemented it. Um, so it, it, it did amuse me that they have this section. Um, do I need to know about diffused expressions? And they say, you know, you'll really need to know it's important to know that a function diffuses its arguments um, because you might have to deal with it. But then they don't really, like, I don't feel like they really answer, do I need to know? 
if you are writing code that writes code, uh, understanding diffuse, uh, diffusing is really useful. Um, that's kind of all. <laughs> Otherwise, just use all their helpers. So uh, therefore, I do care. <laughs> um, I writing code that writes code is kind of like my my favorite thing. Um, I have a package on CRAN that is desperately in need of an update called Factory. It's for writing function factories. Um, and then I am working on the Speedkeeper project to uh, scaffold packages that wrap APIs. I don't yet have any um, expert type of stuff in there. It's all like string literal stuff, like I'm writing the code, but I can imagine I will probably. And so um, that'll probably be useful to me. Does anyone have any thoughts around this? Uh, um, I, I have a question on something you said. So you said factory for function factory, and then you also prior to that said function that creates functions. And in my mind, I always thought that was exactly what function factory was. So can you- Yeah, so um, real quick. Use it, um, yeah. All right. So uh, function factories are functions that make functions, but it, they make like very specific. Um, each one is built to make a specific uh, kind of family of functions. Um, you can make them like, uh, I don't know how much I want to go into the full details, but the idea is so a function factory, you might have a function factory that is um, make, you know, makes a function for taking something, its input to the power of something. So function exponent takes it, what it returns is this function that takes X and raises it to whatever you set exponent as. So if you set it to two, it's a square function. If you set it to, um, I don't think I show it here, but if you set it to three, it would be, you know, take the cube of whatever you put in. Um, but the problem is the way it's written there, it's really fragile. If you change exponent um, outside, like uh, that can change what happens. And so to, to not go on the tangent too long, but my, fact, my function or my package basically wraps the function factory. Actually, it's the metaprogramming chapter of advanced R second edition into a package to do the function factories that are less fragile, easier to read. Um, they, the source code is actually readable. I don't I have it here somewhere. Yeah, um, that in a normal function factory, the source code looks like that. The output function so source code has exponent in it, but it doesn't tell you what the heck exponent it is. And so um, mine creates output like you can actually see what the function does. Oh, that, okay. So it translates the, it into something more readable. Yeah. And so, yeah, so you can see. you're more or less diffusing it right away and then creating the function with the diffuse definition. So that kind of the idea. Or like with the you're injected calculating the value. Definition. Yeah, you're injecting yeah. the the value of that expression into the source code. So it's not like reading from an environment or like passing an environment along, basically. Right. Yes. Um, or I should say so you're evaluating the value of any thing that's used in creating the function before you run it. So it's like auto force and then yes. Print. And so yeah, the actual output function is the thing that you meant. Like this is a weird, weird, weird case. Um, the reason it hasn't been updated in a long time is I actually ended up not using it much at all myself, but occasionally I still do. And actually, I'll, there's a good chance I'll be using it for Beekeeper, and so I'll probably go back and update it. Um, now that I understand things a little better myself. Um, so that kind of thing is where you want to use expert because, um, uh, I mean, honestly, I need to look back and see it's possible. Embrace will work in some of the places that I used expert in there. Um, so we'll see how that goes. Um, but yeah, it's it's when you want to like, know what the user typed in you know like what functions they used in order to create the output 
Um, the example I have here is, uh, and I do not speak French, so I cannot properly pronounce this package. Esquisse. All right. Esquisse uh, is a, um, it's like a shiny app for interactively building ggplots. And so it is writing ggplot code for you. Um, and so you're using drop downs and stuff to create the code. And then it'll, uh, let's see if we can see an example. Yeah, you load in a data set, you do some different things with that data set. And then in, um, it let, it builds the ggplot2 code that you can then like output. Um, oh, it's not gonna show us there yet, but yeah, you can move legends around whatever. And then at the end, it gives you this button or this option to get the actual code to generate what it, what it made. So that's an example where they're like, um, they want to both use the code and show the code. And so they're, they're doing things in there where they capture uh, the generated code. Um, so yeah, that's the kind of situation where these can be useful. Any other thoughts on that before we dive in a little bit deeper? All right. So why is it called diffusing? Um, I thought this was uh, just interesting to keep track of. I don't, as far as I can tell, this isn't a general computer science term. I could be wrong, but I, don't, I think this is kind of their terminology. Uh, so they give this example going into how lazy evaluation works in R, that you have this function ignore that doesn't care what you send into it, it'll return null. And otherwise there's the base R function force, which whatever you send into it, it returns. Um, the purpose of force is, you know, like in function factories that you can make, you can kind of set the value because otherwise R doesn't do anything with the inputs until they're used. That's lazy, That's what's called lazy evaluation. So with ignore, it doesn't matter what you put in as an input, it never gets evaluated. And so you, you know, they put the warning, boom, that nope, it never gets the warning because it isn't used. That argument is ignored um, with lazy evaluation. Versus enforce, as soon as you call that, the well, as soon as it hits this, the R gets evaluated and the warning goes off. Um, and they they likened that and they actually also showed like a multi-layer one where it doesn't, you know, you could have functions that are calling functions that um, the top level argument never actually gets evaluated. And so you never trigger the, the boom. And they were saying that it's like this booby trap that once you touch it, it'll go off, whatever the argument is. And by diffusing the argument, you are of making the booby trap not go off. So even if it is touched, it, it won't actually get touched because it's like this extra level of holding on to that, um, what the input was. And so uh, when you do expert of that, it doesn't go off. Um, and yeah, Gus had a comment about function factories that I'm gonna come back to in a second. Uh, so yeah, they, the quote was, in a way arguments are like booby traps which explode or evaluate when they're touched. Diffusing an argument can be seen as diffusing the booby trap. Um, yeah. Uh, so the the need for force in a function factory is confusing, which is part of why I made the package to uh, kind of deal with it. That um, sometimes you if you don't force your arguments you can break things and other times you don't and i have i go into that a little bit on the force um uh readme which i don't think i mean on the factory readme i don't think factory even has a package down site yet which i will be fixing pretty soon because since we're going through this stuff i think i'll probably have to actually touch my package that uses all of it all right so yeah that's why it's called diffusing it's just because of this analogy which i, I think works pretty well. Um, I don't know that diffuse is entirely right because that implies that the bomb will never go off. It's more that you're just like, uh, you know, wrapping it in bubble wrap or something, but uh, bubble wrapping doesn't sound as like as much like a useful programming concept. Um, I don't know, but like you could still like you could still like make use this expert, but then also 
defeat like no like trigger the argument after capturing the argument you know like you can capture this yeah. expression and still trigger the argument so it's not like it's not like you've diffused the argument permanently it's right, like exactly. you've just temporarily captured, you've captured the state it's like it's more i think more like snapshot of or like capturing the expression or, of um right or yeah you've 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 frozen it you've uh uh you have a frozen copy i don't think you've frozen yeah. it from ever going off right like, right like you could still have a different force warning or accidentally force it in a different way like in a different spot that is true um right and so it's not a perfect analogy but that's but the general idea is that it you're holding on to it but then um, I don't know if I ever actually use the terminology in my notes, but then inject is the other side, which also is in a perfect analogy because inject has nothing to do with diffuse, but it's where you take your thing that you have diffused and then set it off basically, uh, let it go on and do its thing. Um, but you can inject, um, actually I'll hold off on that about environment stuff. So, all right. There are three types of diffused expressions. It's just basically there are three types of um, expressions <laughs> that you can have calls, which are you know like a function. Actually, both of those are function calls. Um, a call is the action of calling a function to compute a new value. It's not the value and it's not the function. It's like the use of the function. Um, you can have symbols like you know x, df, mt cars, whatever. It's the named objects. And then you can have constants, which are like the actual object. Um, I thought it was interesting that they include constants on the list because diffuse constants are just the constants. They, they're they still, there they are themselves. So like if you do expr of one, it is one. It, it's not because you can't really do anything to diffuse. It's not, It's our, it has already gone off. There's nothing to evaluate at the constant level. Um, Anyway, so that is confusing, and I didn't necessarily make that clearer, but there are the three types. The constants, um, again, they mention it because, okay, technically this is a thing, and maybe it'll come up when you're programming with a, with things, um, but it's, uh, I mean, it very well can come up because if someone sends you in, you know, they might send in a constant where you're capturing something, and um, you need to be able to deal with that, so. All right, so on those three types, um, actually, I refer to the three types in the next slide, but then this one. So how, how do we create diffuse expressions? The base, basic one is our lang expr. Uh, it captures what you send in. So expr of foo is foo. Expr of mean of foo narm true is mean of foo narm true. Like it just holds onto it, uh, freezes it in place. Um, it's important to note that this is you, the the developer like this is when yes. you type stuff into the command line yes like in the console and, and the reason that that's important and we're going to talk about it in a minute but is it, it it's like literally what you typed it's not where you typed it and so um it, when you use expert if you move this uh frozen expression to somewhere where foo is not defined and then you evaluate it, you'll say, hey, foo's not defined, even though it might have been defined in the place where you captured it. Or conversely, if you move it to an environment where foo is defined, it'll be, okay, I'll use the foo that's here. It doesn't have any state in that way. Um, and that's as opposed to end quote that we'll talk about in a little bit. We're good right. for bad. Yes. <laughs> So how else can we create diffuse expressions? Um, so the reason that those types are useful is that they are the names or they're you know, basically the names of the creation functions in Arlang or actually in base. So sim is how you make, how you can make a, um, a build up an expression of a um, name. So X is foo, in, you know, the character foo, sim of X is, the same as saying expert of foo. So it like does the evaluation of X and then captures that. Um, call is a base function that um, you can like send in arguments to the thing that you're gonna construct the call out of. So it's, you know, you're sending in this argument, which is 
actually foo because sim of x is foo. You can send in the argument of NARM and that that is creating this expert call. So it's call this mean of blah and hold on to it as the call is what the, the call function is saying. Let's make the expert of it. Um, call is the base R function. We're going to talk a little bit about it, uh, if, assuming we get to the function references, that there's also call to in R lang, which is basically call just um, they're very opinionated about how arguments should be and stuff. And so that they, they don't like the base R version of it. It doesn't have some safety things that they want, that sort of thing. So call to is basically call just with some um, added features. All right. Um, oh, that did I skip? Where was the enquo? Did we talk about enquo? I could have sworn. Oh, I guess up here. No, I, I huh. I, there's supposed to be a slide about enquo, and uh, I did not include it. So um, I'll go just back up to the very beginning. That the thing that we kind of danced around, and I thought sure I had a slide about is. Enquo, and we'll start with just enquo. It's like expert, except it also holds on to the environment either by default, it's like where um, where the user sent things from. So if you use this in a function, it's looking at the calling environment. And um, so it's capturing what they said and also the environment in which they said it. So expert just captures what they said. Enquo captures uh, the environment where they said it. Um, it's it, like they don't really talk in this section about quo, which also does exist uh, for completeness. Quo is um, like end quo, except it just captures it in like the environment that you call it in. So it doesn't really uh, have that um, the caller environment level to it. I use sometimes when I'm just trying to understand what will happen inside of my function, because if you call quo, it's as if you called end quo inside of the function. Um, so n is supposed to be for environment, I believe, but I always uh, think of it as it's in, it's inside, uh, Spanish n inside of the function. Um, so you use the n verbs inside of the function uh, to like capture what was happening outside. Um, and quos is just like enquo, except it makes a uh, a vector of quo. And then, oh, the quo part is closure, which is quoted closure. It's uh, like the call and the environment where it was made. Um, again, these are like C or CS terms, I think. I think closure is a general thing, or maybe it's something they made up. I'm not sure. Um, it's a quoting closure, by the way. Yes. Sadly. Um, quote meaning it captures the expression, closure meaning it captures the environment. Yes. Uh, so I, oh, man, gosh. I thought, sure, I had notes on this. But so yeah, there's the end quote stuff. Plus end quote is for what the user um, supplies. And then I didn't really go into much that um, you know, we have in other things talked about kind of the other end of this that you use uh, bang bang. So end quo, uh, uh, end quo and then bang bang is what uh, embrace does. So, uh, you know, arg is end quo arg. So they're saying, okay, think of arg as arg where the user defined it. And then once we actually use it, we use bang bang arg. And that takes this thing that was captured and uncaptures it. It injects it into that spot as if it or as it was when the user typed it. Um, that pattern together is what embrace does. So that's why these get used less and less anymore. Um, Here you can also diffuse like bang bang a symbol, right? That's been captured, yes. or an expression that's been captured. I think the only thing different is that it doesn't capture the environment. So exactly. Yes. Um, and so if you bang bang, names, really. Right. Yep. Um, and again, like those aren't I I strongly suspect all the places that I have used um 
ex expert or enquo and then bang bang probably could be embraced now or maybe like the glue syntax or different you know they have different things that are easier to deal with ways of um using this and even today people would be writing code that does it the art old way because there are tutorials including advanced r like the the book that is purportedly the uh book on how hadley says to do things doesn't have embrace in it because embrace didn't exist when he wrote the book um and so people are still doing it like if you have just in quo and then immediately bang bang or even you'll see bang bang and quo arg um all as one thing that's what embrace does so don't do that. Um, and then Embrace also like deals with some corner cases. And so uh, you almost always want to but, use uh, Isn't Embrace. that uh, the challenge here that you can, you can only have one value, right? So um, generally I've used it for a column name. And uh, I think where I have, I mean, I, I think the most recently, the Embrace is the most recent one, right? And I think I really was happy knowing that this can be done now very easily. You can read it, whether it is on left-hand side or right-hand side, it can be used in a most convenient <laughs> way, you know, as against all other things. But I have uh, ended up doing, you know, using uh, or, or, you know, to put it in a better way, I have been in situations where I, you know, I tend to make a function where I want the flexibility to be able to send one uh, column name or more. So it's a character string, not just one value. And that, that is something I don't think Embrace can still handle. Not it's not a way to uh, do that. Not Embrace, but that would be like and close, bang, bang, yeah. bang. But yeah, it's... yeah, that um, that that would be where you want to use uh, uh, dots. dynamic dots. And I don't yeah. remember if uh, I don't think we have talked about this particular um help page which actually doesn't have a lot of, about it um so usually um what i would do is like capture it with um actually list two which or um so you take the dots and put them into a list and then you bang 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 the list um there we go. That, that takes dynamic dots, or you can do dots list. I can never remember exactly, and I have to always look it up and play around. Um, but yeah, so you say, okay, the dots are coming in. Dots are list two. I do things with them in that list, or I can. Um, that's not really showing the example, but uh, it's not really clear not. here. But um, okay, yeah. You he wants to say so hi. so yes hello hello but yeah you uh, i guess to go back to your actual statement that yeah no you don't use embrace with with more than one for sure um it and the actual pattern you use depends on kind of what you're doing um so question what do you think if would you would it make sense to make embrace automatically accept like or would it make sense to have some sort of operator that autom like diffused like auto diffused rather a vector yeah. of expressions like that yes yes <laughs> i know it's what you want but i'm just saying so like, like is that even curly. possible to exist like oh, I, I don't know <laughs> i don't i wish i actually so that so that's one part of it and then the other part of it for me is that i'm not even sure that embrace helps the problem if that makes sense like i feel like and this isn't necessarily calling out Jack, but like I saw this thread. You know, Kai just started a thread in R4DS about like embrace and then quo and whatever. And I find that a lot of the time people just get handed a recipe of how to do X yeah. thing and without like making sure they understand why X thing works. And like embrace, I feel like is kind of in that <laughs> area code where tidy, tidy eval invented this to make it easier because it should work should just work in most cases where you That's, want a single variable but so i, feel I like guess people don't understand what the what they're doing with when that happens and I, like I, I don't know that that's yeah helped. yeah um 
Jenny Bryan gave a talk uh, right when all this stuff was coming. That one might have even been before Embrace. It was our uh, our studio count 20... 19, 20? 19, 19, I think. I think it was the one in Austin. Um, it was in Austin, or was it the one after that, like on the during the pandemic, that was like the first one that was like online, online? So, oh no! So it wasn't that for sure. It was. Oh, I it was in person. person. Okay. Okay. So it was yeah, either so San be... Fran. So it was 2020, which was San Fran, or uh, 2019, which was Austin. I think it was 2020 2019. was the pandemic, so it would have been 2019 for sure. Yeah. Yeah. Well, 2020 it, it, yeah. it happened, happened at the end of January. Conference. Yeah. Oh, that's right. January. Yep. And then. Okay, yeah. Uh, our studio global was online in 2021 um anyway so she gave a talk and uh one of the first things she talked about in it is that a lot of times you know you if you're just taking it. dots and then passing the, the the those arguments on to like um some other uh, uh group by for example just put just pass the dots you don't have to do anything you don't have to do list two you don't have to do bang 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 just literally put the dot 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 into that call to that um, tidyverse function. Uh, the problem is having a function that does case. group by and summarize, and yeah, you want right. to pass arguments into that function to do both. Right. Which yes. is Which is rough, but yeah. Yes. I, I'm so like, yeah, that um, that often is the case. So watch out for that, and I'll I'll put that talk into the channel if i haven't already because um it's really good it's it's basically her talk was about you uh it, it's titled something like um oh is this uh yeah, what is the was it it wasn't called lazy evaluation was it and yeah this is in austin um but it was like you probably don't need the tidy verse or something like that. Or sorry, yeah, you probably don't need tidy right. eval. Um, so okay, yeah. Um, yeah, should tidy eval be abandoned? Uh, will tidy eval kill the tidy verse? Like people were really hating on tidy eval at that time because the embrace didn't exist yet. Um, and so. Is it going to kill us? Hold on, wait. Yeah. Um, but she she talks, uh, I thought it was earlier in here, but she talked pretty early about, yeah, you know, you probably don't need it. A lot of times you don't need to do any of this fancy stuff. This is the talk, right? Or did she have two that year? Um, I think uh, Lionel, I think he did a talk too where he was talking about just yeah, this is not the one. You I may not need it, but if you need it, this, this is, is just the works. slide you remember, John. Like this one, right? Oh, like this, oh right here. Okay, this yeah, is yeah. the slide that you remember because that's also what I remember from this talk. <laughs> that's is, that's really funny. Here's a whole bunch of mumbo earlier. jumbo, but you just need to know this. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Which is right about the top, like the level of our talk that yeah. I needed at that moment. Yeah, that's really funny. Um, Which is so funny, right? Yeah. Okay, so yeah, the, this slide is, I thought this was the very beginning of the talk. Um, pass the dots. So she, yeah, she shows like, you know, you can just pass the dots through a lot of times. Um, and then, and quo and bang, bang, no, you just need embrace. Um, you don't need our lang though. You can use in quo and bang, bang without uh, importing our lang. Um, and then, yeah, the walrus you do need sometimes. Anyway, um, this is really useful. Like, watch the video because she gives really good talks. Um, but it's funny that I only remembered the end of the talk. I think uh, that because... back half was like as good a pitch as the whole the rest of the talk. Like, you just need yeah. to know. I just think here's how much tidy eval you need to know to do X thing. <laughs> and then, like, eventually it gets to like end quote and bang bang. But like, right. you can tell this is like four years ago now because. We don't, they don't recommend that anymore. They just tell you, oh right. yeah, just use this. So yeah, there was a whole, there was a package that would help you write the um, upper Arlang. And I think that package has officially been like 
uh, archived because like don't don't do what it says they they have lots of stuff with like n sim and i don't think you're ever advised to use n sim even though it does still exist um i think it still exists we'll we'll see as we go through anyway um so a lot of times a lot of times you just want to pass the dots or you want to capture it as a list two and then bang 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 it in various places where you would want to use those dots and that's basically just if you want to pass the dots multiple times and in different ways, you want to do different things. Like in some places you want to hold on to it like a list and other places you want to, uh, you know, whatever, inject it, um, splice it, I guess. Yeah, okay. yeah. I have done weird things with dots um, and I just learned not to. So <laughs> I just, I think at some point for this club, we should do like a um, code review help each other simplify uh, some code or how, why did you use our lang in this way or something like that. So, um, because the, it is all very uh, confusing or a lot of it is. So we do have a separate thing that we will be doing uh, later. The, you know, we have all these other things, injecting with bang, 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 and glue syntax, that one's gonna be really good. That's uh, on deck to be the next one. And I can't remember how I split it up. Um, do I have it up in there? Okay. Um, okay, yeah, they're all separate. Um, you know, metaprogramming patterns will probably be really useful of showing us th different ways to do things. What are quoters and when are they needed? That's gonna be, so that's a separate conversation. I'm not gonna totally answer these things yet because we have other uh, overviews to go through. I did want to talk a little bit about the um, most of this stuff exists in some form in base R that uh, expert is a uh, B quote from base R. Um, I have links in a minute, but it's uh, is it back quote. The Lisp back quote macro is what B quote. I always wondered what the heck the B was. Um, <laughs> it, this one actually, I read this. Uh, base R help because of the Arlang help. And I was like, wait, except uh, terms wrapped in dot parentheses uh, are evaluated in the environment. And then you can do splice equals true and then have things wrapped in dot dot parentheses. It's like, oh, they have bang, bang and bang, bang, bang built into B quote, except it's just different. Like, I didn't know that. Um, like, it's like better than end quote because you can specify <laughs> environments wherever you want. It, well, <laughs> But yeah, I mean, yeah, actually, you can do that with end quote as well. Um, can you specify arguments? Can you specify environments with end quote? You can. So uh, uh, we'll come to that in a second. But yeah, so B, B quote is expert. Basically, uh, substitute is end quote. Um, so substitute takes expression and environment. And it uh, substitute is, if you've ever seen any weird black magic uh, code, it all has a substitute in it somewhere. Substitute does all kinds of weird things, but um, it returns the parse tree for the unevaluated expression expert. So you pass a thing in and it like figures out how it would be parsed, but it doesn't parse it. Uh, go ahead, Priya. I used um, substitute and deparse together to yep. read the name of a data frame. So the name itself, because I wanted to look for a substring in that name and do certain operations, if not do something else kind of thing. So yeah, uh, so when you pass DF, it's the DF itself, you know, gets treated as a DF. And then if not, if I wanted the name, that's when I used substitute D parse. <laughs> yeah, uh, again, I'm sure I have some in uh, factory and they probably, well, not, not substitute. I don't think I use substitute anywhere. Um, yes, I do need add block. Uh, for random uh, Wonder Woman ads. Um, so uh, so that's the base equivalence. And then enquos and um, it isn't, doesn't exactly exist. Um, sorry, I had a call coming in that I am ignoring because, but it's ringing in my headphones. Um, but, uh, okay. Um, but yeah, so there isn't an exact equivalent of end quotes that he shows that you can do it with. Again, this base R 
uh, black magic eval substitute a list dot 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 is equivalent to in quotes dot dot dot. Okay. Um, yeah, and so that's that's the base of our equivalence. And then I did have uh, to do a, a list of of all these things that we kind of talked about. Um, we'll see how much we actually get through. I want to open this up in its own and open these up and fly through. Oops. So we just looked at some of those, but um, expert the expert help doesn't really have anything in it. It says, go see the other help. And so there's nothing super useful there. Um, it has some examples, but uh, mostly it's telling you go read other help. So nothing really to do there. Um, the Enquo help, again, doesn't talk a lot about anything. Um, it tells you where it's useful. That's kind of nice. That's useful for data masking uh, when you're working with data masking functions. Um, and, but it tells you learn about uh, embrace and uh, or in data masking mask programming patterns because you probably don't need Enquo. Um, I'm trying to think. So uh, yeah, Enquo. Sorry, you cannot set the environment for Enquo. Um, I am thinking of one of the other an expert? deeper ones. No, an expert, you can't capture environment at all. I think it's new closure that you can create, you can yeah. specify. But like, again, we're talking like deep levels of. Yeah. Um, What's angle zero? Yeah. Sorry, I'm just looking at this again. For the first time. So they don't enable injection. So you can't put injection, you can't inject things inside of them. Um, we're gonna. This is slated to come up in one of the advanced ones uh, later, so we'll we'll get into it there, if it becomes useful, and if not, we'll try to talk about it at the end. I don't know is the uh, answer to what is it. Um, we'll talk yeah. about it more. Okay, why? Uh, <laughs> yeah, um, because they needed things somewhere under the the hood. So again, um, our RDRR is full of ads, but it, this eval is like the opposite. It's how you take the thing and uh, use it. In base R, but in uh, our lang, we have eval tidy, which basically lets you use pronouns. It's the the point of eval tidy. So it takes your expression, and then uh, you can do it in context of a particular data mask. Um, and here you can tell it what environment you want to do the evaluation inside of. Um, uh, it's not. You know, they they point out that's not applicable for closures because they capture the environment where they um, were created or where they came from, not necessarily where they're created. Uh, and then eval bear is basically eval, um, but it does some uh, cleaner things. Again, it's like what I was saying with um, call two that they have some of these functions that are just. We don't like some of the default behavior. And so we made our own. That's basically the same as the base function, but uh, does some error handling that we deal with. Um, it goes into convince. this whole. We could not it, convince core R developers to do oh, what we wanted. So we made this. <laughs> yeah, well, we can't like, we couldn't change core base eval because it would break half of R. So we made our own eval bear that is like it, except it um, behaves more like eval tidy is basically what it is because there are cases that don't make sense for eval tidy that did make sense for eval. And they're like, well, but we want something that's like eval that kind of fails in the same way so that we can write all of our code parallel. Um, so that's what's going on with eval bear. It's mostly around um, like the call stack, which I think we're going to get into towards the end of this club. Um, call stack stuff, but um, that's eval bear. We'll talk more about it later, I think. Um, there's this whole family of like, quo is missing, quo is symbol, quo is call, quo is symbolic, which is different from quo is symbol, uh, quo is null, quo get expert, quo get env, quo set expert, and quo set env. So these last or you can just you can pull apart a quo and see the expression and the environment that are inside of that quo, and you can actually change the expression or the environment that are inside of the quo. Um, 
like again that'd be very very um specific use cases but you know let's say i don't know there's some like path through a family of functions where yeah you want to capture where they defined it but then you do something that kind of should change um the data frame that they're working in or something like that and so there you want to say oh no now i want to set the environment to be my updated version of their environment that's what's going on there the all the is ones are just um returning true or false so is the like is the quo null because again when we talked about uh capturing null uh, if you do expert of null that is null it's the same as uh uncaptured but with a quo it has an environment and so anyway they have this quo is null quo is symbolic is basically um is it either a call or a symbol will return true for quo is symbolic um and then the other ones are just like testing is it uh you know is it a call is it a symbol is it nothing so is it did we take in an argument and there was nothing there so that's the quo is missing um So yeah, so that's all that. So symbolic returns. True or false? False if you pass it a constant. Yes. Let me make sure. Uh, that. You, you had it notes here at one point, but I think. Yeah. Why is it not? So. So you like a new closure, oh. but you like. Um, if you do pi or something. So it's, is it, um, is it an expression or a. So if we go back to uh, this. It's saying, is it one of these two? Yes. Okay. So it's, it, it, yeah. Okay. Um, I don't, Things like, I, would I don't ever use, but that's yeah. Bad. Yeah, exactly. I don't know when this would be useful, but I, I don't know. Um, I can yes. I can definitely imagine special things that you would want to happen if they send in null and after you had captured it you want to do deal with it um, versus if they sent in any sort of ex like normal expression I want to do something so that's what these are around these are probably used under the hood in various like you know embrace might use some of these things um, so yeah that's those uh, I think that's all the useful info there. Um, uh oh in quo's call there is this namespace ns argument that can be interesting like is this um it, it's checking is it a like does it count as a call in this particular namespace will what does it make sense in this namespace so um it checks that it's namespace to the right place so um again i can imagine weird metaprogramming cases where that would be useful. Um, sim sims are, again, for creating, uh, taking a string and turning it into symbols or a uh, vector of symbols. And then data sim, data sims uh, use the, um, like the, the data pronoun um instead of symbols so that it's it's again probably used under the hood in a lot of things oh there's a quote symbolic in the wild uh oh is this which I guess package it's a chart package that john cohen made at one point um but this must be copied okay. from ggplot i guess or something like that but he, yeah it's like aesthetic like evaluation but you okay check if it's a closure to plot it and otherwise you pull out a constant seems yeah. strange but okay <laughs> yeah I, i'm trying to figure out like i'm yeah. trying to i'm still wrapping my head around because you know point of just seeing it it's like what why but i, I don't for sure get it. and it's not symbolic then 
get the expression out of it and ignore the environment. Yeah. Um, it, yeah, and, and it is doing the, it's like, you know, moving it into the global environment um, for backward compatibility. So because of whatever he does downstream of there is why it does that. So now it's um, a closure that evaluates in the global environment. Like it's yeah. an expression. So the X part's the expression and it he's basically overriding the expression to exist from the global environment. Yeah. Um, Which feels like you could just use an X. No, because yeah. inside of the uh, right, wherever right. it is. So he wants to override the plot. Like when he's writing this plot aesthetic, he wants it to evaluate with whatever's in the global environment. Yeah, for whatever reason. And we would have to dig much deeper down to figure out why. Um, I'm not really clear, like, what's the difference? Like, so if it's not a symbol, he just wants to take the number and then just return a constant constantly? Yeah. Um, like, like just return the expression. Then if yeah. it is a symbol, he wants to make sure that the, the... So like if you have mean, no, if you have like some X variable, you wouldn't evaluate it inside of wherever that function is being called because he must be constructing some kind of plot object or something. Yeah. Because like ggplot creates a ggproto and then it renders on print, like it evaluates all the code when you print it, right? Yeah. So it must be he must be trying to pass it to a different environment. Something. Um, Strange. Anyway, so G -G plot is weird, but okay. <laughs> right. Um, sorry, I'm not doing that. So so yeah, that's symbols and then data sim. Data sims is like working with data pronoun, and um, we have another. Uh, I, I think this comes up in. Um, I don't know if it ever does come up. So when would we use it? I don't, uh, I, I, in creating things that accept the data pronoun is where you would use data sim and data sims, I think. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> um, so this must be what data the data pronoun does it's, under the hood? The data it, pronoun doesn't do anything under the hood, but the functions that use the data pronoun do this under the hood, I think. Um, right. Yeah. That seems strange, but okay. I guess it makes, well, R is a function, so it must be parsing for wherever dot data is used and then turning that into this function? Um, effectively, yes. Um, because Something I can imagine like, like this is the sort of meta programming that tidy eval would do under the hood. Right. Um, so then I pulled up the uh, call. Um, so that's, you know, again, you you construct a an expression that is a function, um, a character. So in call, it has to be a character string of the function, and then the dots are arguments to be part of the call to that function. And then again, it constructs the call to that function. It doesn't execute the call to the function um, versus, so that's that's the base version. Um, call to, uh, it can be a string, a symbol, a call, or a function for the dot fun fn argument. So it doesn't have to be a string like it is in base, which actually is kind of interesting because a lot of the rlang functions are stricter than base, this is less strict, um, but it quotes whatever you send in. So you can send in mean or quote mean or a like reference to mean um, or a call to mean. Oh, and lost, we lost 10. Um, oh, he has to go to a work call. Um, oh, cause it's, yeah, we are out of time. So um, if we need, I think we will be going into call two in a little bit more detail again later on when we have the call stack. So we'll, we'll talk in more detail then. Um, but it's basically the same as the base one. 
Uh, B quote, we talked about a little bit. Substitute, we talked about a little bit. And we are not going to talk about parsers. So I'm going to knock that or note that in the notes that we haven't talked about parse expert. And um, I will really quickly talk about there is expert print, which is just for um, printing expressions. Um, it does some prettier things on, on printing. I don't have it uh, handy to show you, but that's all it is. Um, so uh, let's, let, I guess let's try this. So they show it a little bit there, but let's do it real quick uh, here. It'll do like it tells you that it's in, um, okay. Versus if you just do one to three, it's that. And if you do um, expert one to three, like it, it only shows you kind of what it is. Um, so that's not showing anything super fun funky, but it does a little bit of just calling things out more clearly. Um, So you can kind of see all the, the stuff that it's doing under the hood there. Um, yeah, and then, okay, yeah, we're getting some coloration in there of what's where. So that's all it's for is this expert print is for printing things. And it's basically so that they could debug things more easily. So I'll mark that when it's done. Um, and we didn't talk about that. So that's... Uh, most of the, <laughs> that article on metaprogramming, oops, I do want um, this. So again, we will talk about a lot more with metaprogramming. That's just the very beginning of what the heck diffusing is. Uh, the main takeaway I would want you to take from this is that um, diffusing is expert or end quote, and it like captures the thing without letting it go off. Um, and then past that, we'll be talking about how, how to use that in the coming weeks. So this is getting into the really complicated and confusing stuff. So, um, you know, I understand if I didn't really help your understanding this week, but hopefully as we go, we'll get there. All right. I will see everyone on uh, Slack. Thanks, John. All right. Thank, Thank you. you. Bye. -bye. <laughs> Bye.